She's hiding. She's, she's, don't worry, she won't go unscathed. Good morning, and we'll call to order the meeting of the Regional Transportation Commission of Southern Nevada. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the Commission, your agenda is in order and ready for approval. Motion on the floor. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Item number two is to receive the general manager's report, and we do have a report this month. First of all, I would like to introduce to you for our presentation today one of my local heroes, Rossi Rollin Cotter, president and CEO of the Las Vegas Visitors and Convention Authority, is here to give you a presentation and an overview on some very exciting plans that they've got in the works. Um, we appreciate very much Rossi taking time to present to you and to emphasize the importance of transportation in his master plan. Mr. Morning. Rollin Cotter, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Commissioner. If we could hold on just for a sec, we're going to... Let our folks file in. Okay. All set. Uh, thank you very much, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be here and talk about some great news for Las Vegas and for our convention business and the vision that we have at the convention center itself. We presented this to our board a couple of months ago, and we got full approval from them as well as support from the resort industry. And we have now been going out and making this presentation because this is for all of us who live here. This is for us to make sure that we continue the tourism business uh, moving forward as rapidly as it has been in the last couple of months, uh, as well as the future of our convention business. And so I'm gonna walk you through uh, our Las Vegas Global Business District concept. It has four major components. Uh, and then if you have any questions at the end, I will be glad to answer those. So if you look at this rendering here, and what we have decided to do is that this is a business district that we're gonna create. Uh, it'll be a public-private partnership amongst many of us as we go forward. This is a view looking at the convention center from uh, Convention Center Drive. Uh, if you were standing there, you'd be standing on the old Stardust property. Uh, but this again is to revitalize the entire area. It's all about the customer experience, the brand experience, delivering on the brand promise of Las Vegas, to the convention delegates and convention people who are come to our city. The one thing we want to stress throughout all of this is that we truly are an international city, and we need to think in those terms, and as we go forward and make decisions that impact visitation, uh, both on the leisure side as well as the convention side, we need to think in those terms, and that's what this concept and this vision uh, is going to do for the future. So why are we doing this? You know, if you'll remember, prior to the recession, uh, we had started a project at the convention really to renovate it. Uh, and it was done in phases, and the first phase was really the preliminary sewer water, all the connections that we needed to have, uh, and then the recession hit and we had to stop that project. Um, so when we, when we looked at bringing it back, and as, as business started to come back at the end of November of 2009, we felt that we needed to look at it from a different angle. Checking the competition, our competition has added more than 17 million square feet of space in the last 10 years, all designed to take conventions away from Las Vegas. Uh, the mayor of Chicago just recently said that their number one objective is to take conventions from us. Uh, for the last 19 years, Las Vegas has been the number one trade show destination for the 250th, 50 largest trade shows that are held in North America, number one for 19 years. Our job is to stay number one uh, and to expand that. We have more of those trade shows in Las Vegas each year than <clears throat> number two and number three Orlando and Chicago have combined. And so we need to keep that momentum going. But it needed to be more than just that renovation of the building. You know, we have the brand concept. We live the brand of Las Vegas. We have a very strong brand. But we needed to say, OK, let's take that experience. And how do we connect our building with that? And that's really what we're doing here. It has four components, the brand experience. So we want to welcome our delegates to the building, to the area, to the neighborhood. We want to make sure they have a great experience in the building. And then we say, thank you for being here. And that really is the overall brand experience. So that's the first objective. And the second objective is to look at the building and see how we make it competitive for the next 25 years. And then the third part is the World Trade Center concept, which goes back to that international business community that we're talking about. And the fourth really comes back to all of you, too, as the transportation mix of the destination. So I'm going to touch on all four of those, uh, those concepts. So again, here's just another view of, of looking at the convention center from 
Convention Center Drive, uh, you'd be standing at Paradise right there. Uh, to the left is, uh, is the design concept for the transportation hub for us. Um, I, I still remember the rotunda as a child growing up, and so the architects decided to give me a little bit of a, of a look of that as we have a cover for the, uh, the building. It reminds you of the old rotunda itself. Um, so we're going to have some fun with this too. But, but what we do uh, best for the convention center and what we do with everything is we do research. Every program we have is research driven. So for this project, we went back to our customers, had focus groups with them, uh, customers who have been coming to Las Vegas for the last 10 years, as well as customers who have not been here for a while, to see what they needed to have as far as the building was concerned. The aesthetics of it, we really need to make a signature statement with the architectural design of the convention center. Go around the country, go around the world, and look at the convention centers that have been built in the last 10 years. They all make a statement, and that's part of that brand experience, and so we want to capture that. Then it's technology in the building, making sure that we have the right components for that as we move forward. Convenience, moving our customers throughout the building, and then the transportation side of that. So what did our customers tell us? <clears throat> when you look at this project, and it'll be built in about eight phases over about eight years, and you have to remember that we have to remodel our house while everybody's living in it because we can't move the conventions out. And so any of our plans have to be done in phases. The estimated cost would be about $2.5 billion, all to be paid for out of room tax revenue, which has been the same since 1959. Those dollars are used for three reasons. One, to allow us to market and brand destination Las Vegas, two, to maintain and operate the convention centers themselves here and at Cashman, and third, to give back to the community as our Fair and Recreation Board concept uh, allows us to do. So, they want, so the customers told us we need to add about a million square feet of space, so we'll add another hall. Uh, meeting rooms are very critical. Medical tourism is one of the fastest growing aspects of our business, so we need to have more meeting rooms for that. So we'll add about 350,000 square feet of meeting rooms. Uh, we're going to build a new general session space. When we did have the rotunda, that was a building that we could house 6,000 people for a, a keynote address. We don't have that now. We have to build that for each convention. So we're going to build a general session space. Uh, we're going to take the Joe Brown entrance in the back and make it as impressive and exciting as the front part of the building, be part of that architectural design. And that's for two reasons. Uh, we have multiple conventions in the building many times, and so we need to make sure that that entrance uh, says welcome and, and, and thank you, too. Uh, during the month of March, we have our own March Madness. We'll have anywhere from 19 to 30 trade shows in our building during the course of the month, and so that entrance becomes very, very important to us. The connectivity in our building, and we have a little over 3.1 million square feet of space at the convention center today. With this expansion, we'll go to about 4.2 4.3 million square feet. That's a lot of uh, building to be walking around in. So we need to make sure that the connectivity east, west, north, and south within the complex is there so that we can take care of our customers. So that'll be part of the design of the building itself. We'll look for some iconic structures within the campus so that people can say, I'll meet you by the Las Vegas sign, or I'll meet you by the Moulin Rouge sign, or I'll meet you over by the Sammy Davis Drive, uh, which, is, which could be what we do with our, our lots and so forth, to kind of take a little bit of our old history and connect with the, with the new building itself. Uh, State-of-the-art technology, not only for today, but as we go into the future. Uh, we'll work very closely with our partners at CES, Consumer Electronics, to give us some direction with that. Food service points of sale, again, about the customer service, delivering on the brand promise of the building. Uh, itself, And then the ingress and egress, which, again, I'll talk about as we get to the, the other part of it, but we need to be able to, to easily get, efficiently get our customers in and out of the building. So here again, this is just another rendering. Uh, this is looking down onto the silver lot, which is in front of the building. <clears throat> Many times when you drive by, by the convention center on Paradise, you'll see Con Expo, Con Ag, the big construction convention that has all the Tonka toys. Uh, they'll be out in the front. When we had the Home Builders Convention, they built a couple of houses out there. So that's really an outdoor event area. When SEMA comes in, uh, the automobile uh, trade show, they'll put cars out there. And so we need to dress that up and make that more impressive. If you look to the right of that where the, where the glass is, that's that connectivity that I'm talking about. So if the walkways for people to go uh, from, the, from the North Hall down to the South Hall. And then again, the old rotunda concept. Another look at this, uh, this is part of the, uh, the transportation network. Uh, currently, we have all forms of transportation coming in and out of the convention center, except for 
um, what I'll talk about, which would, could, should be or could be a, a type of a light rail system that may connect the destination itself. Uh, and so we will design so that we can be a hub for that, uh, for the destination. Uh, the World Trade Center. Uh, this is another concept. You know, we always try to stay one step ahead of the competition at the Convent Center, the same way our hotels are on the cutting edge of technology and amenities that they offer to our customers. And um, we made a partnership with the Consumer Electronics Show. They have the license for the World Trade Center uh, Association, and so we have partnered with them. We are the only convention center in the United States that has a World Trade Center designation on our campus. There's about 325 of these buildings throughout the world. It's an organization that's designed to further trade shows, both domestic as well as international. Uh, they provide sales leads back to us. We provide sales leads to them. And so it's, it's a working organization. And for us to have this designation is very critical when we talk about Las Vegas as an international business destination, an international place where you can do business. And so uh, we are going to be looking to build a World Trade Center complex someplace on the Convention Center campus uh, for this. Uh, we hope to have, just as the other buildings have, international brands being housed there. Uh, some of our international conventions we hope will be uh, having offices there. We will move our offices over to that building because any of you who have been to the Convention Center offices, we are in prime real estate. We're right in the front. We need to provide that space for our customers. And so. It's going to make a signature statement for Las Vegas, the business community, the, the trade show community. And we're very excited about that. That could be one of the first parts of the phases that goes uh, as we look to see uh, how we're going to build and construct all of this. And so uh, this partnership with Consumer Electronics is very important for Las Vegas. Again, just another view um, of the Convention Center, Convention Center Drive, uh, different uh, angle there. Um, <clears throat> the architects decided to put V on the side of the light rail thing. All of you know there's that movie, TV show, Visitor. It's not about the visitors. It's not about aliens. It's about the transportation system. So, uh, but they had some fun with that. And then the transportation side. This is, this is another part of this. And you know, when we looked at doing uh, the branding of our building and, and taking care of the customers and, and how we position Las Vegas, being the only city that really truly evolved to host people, uh, we need to continue that. Uh, but we said, okay, what is the one element that will challenge all of us? And so if you look at the resort corridor from the M Resort to downtown, from, say, Industrial to Maryland Parkway, that's 15 square miles. Within that 15 square miles, on a weekend, we will have 325,000 visitors. That's, that's Green Bay, Wisconsin, coming to Las Vegas every weekend. We don't want those cheeseheads here every weekend, but that gives you the scope of what we need to do. Add to that 100,000 workers that have to go in and out of that corridor, and that's a very dense area. If you take the city of Lexington, Kentucky, with about the same population base, uh, their area of, of uh, penetration is about 256 square miles. So very dense, and it's going to get denser because we're adding more things. There's about $2.5 billion worth of construction either going on right now or proposed for the resort area. Our project alone will be two and a half billion dollars. So the confidence in brand Las Vegas, the confidence in our economy is being shown by the investment dollars that the hotels are currently putting in, as well as for future developments. Uh, the Genting project, which has uh, been proposed, there's 3,500 rooms. You've got the SLS guys over at the old Sahara property. So there's going to be more rooms, which means that 39, 40 million visitors that we will attract. We, we attracted almost 40 million last year. We're projecting 40 million for this year. We'll become 45 million visitors in 10 years. So how do you move them around? How do we make sure that they can get from the airport to the Strip or the airport to downtown? How do we make sure that they can get to the Caesars Palace for the start of their show? Can to get to the convention centers themselves? Uh, very dense, and transportation is a key. Pedestrian is a very important part of that. And so we decided to do something that's not really our mission, but because we're Switzerland, to reach out and say, can we bring the transportation community of Southern Nevada together to solve some of these problems, both on a, on a short-term, mid-term, long-term basis? Everybody to kind of take their hats off for a minute, put on an LVCVA hat, a tourist hat, a convention hat, and say, okay, how can we do that? And so we formed this committee. We've had about, about four meetings. 
Uh, we, RTC is part of it. I've got the monorail there, the city, the county, uh, the, the, some hotel uh, representatives, the taxi cab industry, the, the limousine companies, uh, the airport, the university. We're adding more people as we go along. Uh, the Metro Chamber is part of that. Um, and it's really to de determine ways to improve that connectivity, to improve the transportation system. Give you an idea of, and there are no bad ideas in this group, so, but an idea that we've talked about, and I've, I've had these conversations with Tina and with, with Curtis, uh, about the monorail. Okay, here's a transportation system that exists in the, in the destination. I can tell you that when we have a major convention in our building, it is busy. So let's take a look and see, is it possible to take that system from the convention center and go to the Sands Expo, and then from the Sands Expo to go to Mandalay Bay? Very important because it will connect three of the 10 largest convention centers in North America, over seven million square feet of space, and will give us a competitive advantage that nobody can touch. The big trend in our business called co-location, where you have conventions that have like exhibitors or attendees who have similarities, synergies between them as far as uh, their businesses can, are concerned, and they want to be able to meet at the same time. Perfect example, we had the Home Builders Convention here in January, 60,000 delegates, uh, the Surfaces Convention, which is the, is the organization that, and everybody has an organization and a convention, which is great. All the surfaces for, for kitchens and for restrooms and bathrooms and so forth. Yes, you're right, that's true. And they decided to, they wanted to co-locate with home builders. And so they signed a deal. So next year, we'll have 60,000 people in our building for home builders and 20,000 people for surfaces. By extending this system, uh, you do two things. One, you allow us to do more co-location for our trade shows. And number two, you expand the system. You add more capacity. You go to the west side of the strip. Uh, and that, that will enhance our ability to move the customers for the conventions itself. No other city will be able to do that. No other city can give you the amount of square footage. And so those are the kind of things that we need to look forward to and support as a community, as a destination, to make sure that we may remain competitive. Uh, we're talking about uh, looking at the roadways in and out of the airport, um, uh, the roadways around the convention center. That's more of a short-term fix. But we have to make sure that in our project that we have looked at all of the ingress and egress and find out how we're going to move the people around, both, both pedestrian as well as um, uh, the, the, the taxis and the buses and the, and the limos and so forth. Uh, and so everybody together, working together, we believe we can come up with a solution. There'll be funding issues. This isn't a, a situation for the LVCVA to look at funding because our dollars need to go for this expansion. But you know, there's federal funding opportunities, there's state funding opportunities, local government. And so all of us together, because if we don't solve it today, if we don't look at the connectivity today for our resort customers, we're gonna be talking about it three years from now and five years from now. And then the other byproduct of it is that it could expand throughout the valley. And so we provide a, a more easier way for our, our workers, employees, to get to work and take care of our customers. Because the one thing that Las Vegas always has done, it has provided great customer service. That comes back to us all the time. And so, as you can see, we are very excited about this project. It's not just about expanding the convention center. It's a vision for all of us. We're looking to take the neighborhood around us and bring it back. It's private-public partnerships. I want to stress that. It's the government, it's all of us, and private side working together. And so um, as we go forward, uh, we, we've got a couple of things that we're going to be doing here. Uh, this will give you what our phasing is. At my July meeting, we will go in front of the board and ask for resolutions to be passed to, to start the, uh, the bonding capacity for us. Uh, we'll also have a timeline for this. Uh, that will allow us to hire the architectural, or, or to go out for proposals for architectural firms, construction companies, engineering companies. Everything will be done transparently. Every, be, everything will be bid out. We want to get the best of the best for this project. Uh, and, then, and then work with the uh, private side on Convention Center Drive, work with our resort partners, uh, all of whom have been very, very supportive of this concept. Uh, I've been making presentations to the CEOs for about the last six months. And everybody gets this. They understand about improving our neighborhood, improving the transportation system, making sure we stay number one. So that kind of is a short version of, of what we're doing. We are going to, from time to time, come back uh, to you and to the cities and the county to give you an update on the project. I'm sure Tina will be updating you on some of the things happening with the great transportation committee that we have. I give breakfast to them all, so they all show up. 
Uh, but, but again, this is a picture, if you look at this, this is kind of a rendering of the entrance off of Joe Brown, looking from the country club. So you can see, bringing that all back, to the right is the, is the World Trade Center building. Uh, to the left is the transportation system, the hub that comes through our complex. And then a better experience for our customers coming into the back part of the building. So it's, this is an investment for our future. Uh, I've said this in all the presentations that I've, I've been doing in the last couple of weeks. This is the most important decision this community, this destination, this resort industry will make since the building of the convention center funded by room tax to be able to, for us to get into the convention business and to market and brand Las Vegas. So with that, if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to try to answer them. Thank you. Councilwoman. Thank you very much for this very informative presentation. I appreciate your sharing the vision with us. You know, the uh, RTC is the MPO for the Valley, and so we're looking 20 to 50 years out, and it's, it's wonderful to see that the convention center is also considering transportation and moving folks around the Valley, and not just around the Valley, but from the airport to the Strip to the convention facilities. And I know recently I was in the legislature, and they asked me, you know, what, when are we going to have transit down the center of the Strip? And, and thinking about how we're going to move People not today, not tomorrow, not next year, but maybe 20 years from now, when you talk about the increase in, in traffic and population and, and visitation and moving employees and moving um, uh, tourists through here, I think that's something that we need to keep in mind and maybe continue to have those conversations with our strip partners because they are the major employers in the valley. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about, too, is the co-location that you talked about. I think that's really a wonderful advantage. And last, um, or this past week, I was meeting with some of the National Association of Home Builders representatives who were here for the new American home that they just broke ground on. And they were talking, and they were bragging about the fact, and this is a, folks from Boston and from Florida, they were bragging about the fact that they were going to be co-locating here and how exciting it was for them. That's all to our benefit. They're out advertising for us, and that's, that's exciting. And so I, I want to commend you for what you're doing. I think it's important that we continue to, to have conversations to bring the Strip into the whole idea of, of transit and moving more folks up and down the Strip as well. Thank you. The one thing we do share, uh, we're booking our building for the year 2025 and 26 and 27 today. And so we have to be thinking forward. And so uh, uh, our missions are, are, are really parallel. Thank you. Commissioner June Kiliani. Thank you. Good to see you. Um, the dis this is in my district, so I, I appreciate um, uh, Rossi doing the update. Staff had come down as well. And um, I'm, I think it's going to be a game changer for the whole corridor, not just my district. But um, there's a couple of points. We just formed a uh, Maryland Parkway Business Coalition, so, and Terry was there. So thank you for uh, LVCVA participating. We had a great turnout. And it will be a complement for what happens in that corridor as far as revitalization in my mind. Um, if UNLV also gets its stadium dollars, that's going to have another transportation impact that we're going to have to make sure that we incorporate into that part. But it can also tie into uh, resort. Um, in your design, it, will it be green and sustainable as far as the design? Because I think that's what some um, conventions have started to market with, paperless type things and uh, things along those lines. Is that also part of it? I forgot to ask them. That day. will be a goal of every construction project we okay. have. Um, I remember the rotunda. I actually bartended for Aramark a gazillion yeah. years ago okay. for one of the <laughs> things there. Um, I know that we're going to have some zoning items coming up next week, and one thing I'm going to call Luke about because I apologize. I don't want. I know you need short-term storage, but I, along my residential corridor, I want to move that internal as best as we can. So I'm going to call him about making sure that the language is clear for that part. And I think that's really your intent ultimately as well, because it yes. doesn't help with your. Joe Brown's side, if then you have on the other side where the other residential is, where they're having to look at storage. So we'll, we'll play around with that part of it. Um, you and I, I mentioned one time, once, once you get the, the World Trade Center, I do still think that there's one thing Vegas is missing is a multicultural center. And there may be an opportunity for public-private partnerships down the road to really look at creating a multicultural destination as well that could play into the WTC. Uh, we have a wonderfully diverse community here, and we don't, they don't, no one has a place, a sense of home. So that might just be something down the road to take a look at. Okay. Um, and I, I, I support light rail, so I think planning for some components of that, and that is one thing we're, we had a stakeholders meeting from RTC yesterday to talk about light rail and um, uh, BRT, monorail. Ingrid forgot that she doesn't work. <laughs> 
just kidding. Um, Ingrid was there and, 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 and advocated for it. We were looking at all the points of around the corridor that can complement what you're doing. The resorts, uh, worlds, the Genting Group could be another factor that's going to regenerate some of that area. So I was just, um, I just, I'll have to promise David Goldwater that since he was born here, there was never a time where there wasn't a cone on the DI <laughs> road, and I suspect he will probably become a grandfather before all of those go, go away. But I do think everybody will be energized about this part of it, and if it's some point. I don't know if this is on your list. I remember a couple of years back or several years back, you were looking at needing to straighten out Joe Brown. So if there's other things that need to come into play, I'm, I'm, I know the commissioners are more than willing to work with you on those parts of it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments or questions? I just want to thank uh, Tina for aggressively being part of this and the RTC staff. You know, again, partnerships and us all working together. There's, no one can stop us. So, But thank you very much. We'll keep you posted. Thank you, and for the public record and for those in the audience, Mr. Rollin Cotter is celebrating his 40th year with the Convention Authority. A, he started his career? I was five. He was five <laughs> when he started. But those that certainly know Rossi and have worked with him or around him, I mean, his fingerprints are all over this valley, and uh, his personal vision and certainly of the board over the last decade has kept Las Vegas out in front. And Rossi, we certainly appreciate what you've meant to this community, and this is just another step towards the legacy of Las Vegas, and we greatly appreciate all of your efforts, your staff, and certainly your board. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Moving on with our general manager's report, I would like to introduce the gentleman to my left, Mr. Greg Gilbert, who is our new general counsel for the Regional Transportation Commission, and we feel very lucky and blessed to have him joining us. He's only been with us for a few weeks, and he's already told us, you tricked me, this is not a part-time job. But um, we're hoping eventually it eases into a part-time job. He's got extensive, he was selected due to his, his extensive experience in transit and transportation. In particular, he's been working on the Express West project. And um, he's got a lot of uh, congressional ties, federal ties with Department of Transportation, and then also um, has relationships with the state as well. So he brings to the RTC some components that we did not previously have, and we are blessed to have him. He has uh, been in Southern Nevada for about 20 years and feels very strongly, as strongly as we do, um, and passionate about what we do about the development of Clark uh, Southern Nevada. Um, and one of the things we're also very lucky to have with him is he's got a good sense of humor, because uh, we have certainly um, tried him several times already in his position. So thank you, Greg. I want to thank uh, Tina and her team. It's been great to work with them, and I really appreciate the opportunity. I'm also very glad that I did not wear that suit today. Uh, I didn't know that picture would <laughs> flash, but I'm really looking forward to this. There's a lot to be done, and, and you really have in the RTC a, a fantastic team, so thank you. And now he's actually a part of it that we've given him a badge that works. So I kept wondering, why is he not showing up to these meetings? And it turned out because he didn't have a badge that was letting him in. <laughs> Welcome aboard. And, and about, about that double secret probation? Yeah, yeah, he's on it for at least a year. Oh. Don't worry about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Greg is going to have to leave in a little while, which is why we are so lucky that we also have in the audience still Marianne Miller and Chris Figgins, who have been serving us at uh, great, they have been great to us. Um, they have sat in while we have for almost six months now not had a general counsel. They have given us sage and wise advice, the experience that they've got and the passion, again, that they have for Southern Nevada showed and their appreciation and patience with staff is greatly appreciated. And I know Marianne thinks she just gets to sit up there in the audience and blend in, but she doesn't. We would like to have her come down so we can say thank you to her. Our next part of our general manager's report is a fun item. Every year we get to come to you with this item, thanks to our partnership with Coca-Cola and Marianas. We'd like to recognize 20 high school seniors who are with us today, 
and we'll be going home extra happy, we hope, as we unveil the results of the RTC's partnership with Coca-Cola, Marianas, um, and the Clark County School District. Our four organizations teamed up to sponsor the iPad scholarship program that asked local high school seniors to write an essay on the topic of how can you reduce your carbon footprint by using the services offered by the RTC. We received 150 entries this year and we are proud of the students. Before we the, announce the names of the winning students, we'd like to acknowledge Judy Myers, the Assistant Director for Clark County School District Partnership Office. Thank you, Judy. And Ruben Anaya, Chief Operations Officer for Mariana Supermarkets. Um, and we'd also like to thank David Carey, who's Market Unit Vice President with Coca-Cola, and the rest of the Coca-Cola team for their continued support for the students of our community. We got Coca-Cola. This is a really fun program, so thank you so much. All right, now we'd like to announce the names of the winning students who will come forward for a photo. Following the photo, our staff will provide them with their iPads outside of the chambers. Congratulations to all the students and a job well done. So here we go, Jessica Vargas. <laughs> Vanessa McDowell. Nicole Deary. Dave Booth, Jr., Cristobal Gayo, Ashley Briggs, Akiko Govan, Monica Williams, Colin O'Sullivan, Jessica Pippen, Kalana Kevin, Jordan Afaga, Tyler Barnard, Esmeralda Gonzalez, Carol Francisco, Alan Bruno, Emily Tan, Charity Sanders, Juliet Bergon, and Jordan Washaltz. So thank you. Do you want to go to Carson with me on Tuesday? Or you have to okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Hey, can you get me? Tina, is uh, could we have if <clears throat> Judy or Ruben or David wanted to say something to acknowledge them? I think they're all leaving, but perhaps we should have asked that beforehand. Well, I asked them before, and they all politely um, declined. Declined, okay. but I, maybe with you asking, they might. Uh, they're no, gone. They're out. They're okay. gone. <laughs> I think they're outside for photos. But certainly, uh, again, for the public record, we, we appreciate everything they've done. On our last item on General Manager's Report, we would like to recognize Lisa Lomax, who is our superstar of the quarter. And where is Lisa? Lisa, you don't get to stand. You have to actually come down. This is why... This is one of the reasons that she's being recognized. She is so humble and she is so patient with, she works in our, our call service, our customer service. Um, she has been with us for in five years in this position. She's been an integral part of the RTC team, interfacing with customers. Her dedication, professionalism, have recently earned her a promotion to senior. Um, her leadership style is often recognized by her colleagues. She's known for her calm, collected, and patient manner and her capacity to always be pleasant. So Lisa, if you could come up and we will have you have a photograph. Do you want to go on up there with the board? Mm -hmm. 
I know. Oh, she's so cute. Yeah. <laughs> hey, everybody. Now ready? Great, thank you. The call center can be a very high pressure and stressful environment. And uh, Lisa has a personality that is perfect for just keeping calm and collected and handling customers with a very even personality. So much appreciated. Thank you. I'm so shocked. I was wondering why Kenny said, oh, you have to talk to them. I'm like, Kenny, I know you're kidding. I I knew you. And then I see my family here. I'm like, why is everybody here? I'm like, <laughs> And I didn't even know my daughter got up this morning. I'm like, I didn't even see her get up. I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> so I am so humble. Thank you so much. Oh, Thank you're you so wonderful, much. Lisa. We're really lucky to have you. Oh, she's so cute. I know you're doing that on purpose. And I just want to say thank you to her family for coming to show support, too. Very cool of you guys. If Lisa's family could stand and be recognized. Yeah. Yeah. And that, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, concludes your general manager's report. We can move on to agenda item number three, which is to receive the Nevada Department of Transportation director's report from Mr. Rudy Falfabon. I wanted to mention that NDOT issued a letter of support on behalf of the Flamingo BRT project, which the RTC is forwarding for a Tiger Much appreciated. Uh, we weren't able to come up with the entire amount of, of a future NDOT project on Flamingo Road to put towards the project, but we were able to at least commit some funding now and then um, the balance in fiscal year 15 um, should the project be successful in that, that uh, selection process. Uh, speaking of which, I wanted to mention that uh, since that goes to the USDOT, the USDOT Secretary of Transportation uh, has to be confirmed by the Senate still, but uh, President Obama has, is forwarding uh, Mayor of Charlotte, North Carolina, Anthony Fox, who has a different uh, type of background. He's actually a former legal counsel for a transit company. He's been the mayor of, of Charlotte for several years. But he's definitely a, a transit and bicycle advocate in that city, and it'll be refreshing to see a, a different perspective brought to the, the leadership of the USDOT. I wanted to uh, give a heads up to a lot of the member agencies of RTC that we're going to be sending out letters requesting final invoices on some of the federal stimulus projects, uh, ARA projects, as you may know them. The uh, projects are inactive, so the Federal Highway Administration is pushing NDOT to close out these projects before the end of the federal fiscal year. So we'll just have a, a letter giving you a friendly reminder to your public work staff to, to get those uh, final invoices in so we can close the books on those. An update on Project NEON, which uh, is the major widening project on I-15 from Sahara to the Spaghetti Bowl, uh, reconstructing the Charleston interchange, connecting the US-95 HOV lanes to the I-15 express lanes and some additional improvements such as the, the on and off ramps at Alta. The project uh, currently is slated to have a, a recommendation from, from NDOT to its transportation board uh, next month. So on June 10th, the transportation board meets to, to make a decision on what delivery method that we will use to procure that project. We looked at three options, design build with traditional bonding, uh, design build finance, and design, build, finance, operate, and maintain. Much longer term on, on DB, DBF with operate and maintain, 35 year term. What was not looking as uh, likely to occur would be design, build, finance. That was kind of a short term loan, maybe seven years for gap funding. Really would have required some, some hefty payments to pay off the, the borrowing uh, to fund that project. So most likely between design, build, and design, build, finance, operate, and maintain, those are the, the two viable options that we'll be presenting and making a recommendation onto the board. So uh, stay tuned on that. That is a major project. Uh, depending on how, whether we finance some of the right-of-way acquisition, it could be over a $400 million project here in Southern Nevada, that, which will really improve 
mobility and, and safety in that corridor. I was noticing in, in commuting uh, today on the roads, it's just our system is not as reliable as even with all the expansion that we've done. And it's um, really a, a challenge to, to try to maintain a proper level of reliability and service to the, the public on, on our freeway system. A little uh, on the legislative update there, very busy this week with um, another deadline coming up tomorrow for uh, getting bills out of the corresponding committee. Um, the uh, construction manager at risk or CMAR process is uh, going forward with uh, a lot of amendments, a lot of interaction from public agencies on how that process works for them and, and uh, some of the changes that will be forthcoming. Uh, we think that one of the changes is that, that there will be a public meeting or, or that there will be, uh, before the agency procures a project under that CMAR process, there is a, a kind of a ability to have public input on it at a public meeting uh, before the procurement, the RFP occurs for that type of project. We can, we can abide by that requirement. Uh, another one, they're, they're talking about some type of a, a base level of, of uh, project size for for CMAR projects and, and procurement. They don't want it too small, so we're hearing uh, different numbers. But I think that they settled on a, a million and a half. But that that's subject to change. But a lot of the the uh, issues with CMAR ha had to do with um, issues that are more uh, distinct to certain procurements. So, so schools, um, some public buildings, as well as the highway and and, and roads industry and and. Uh, flood control industry are looking at what works for them, but hopefully they'll have a, a bill that works for everybody. The uh, NDOT has, has also got uh, pushing for a road relinquishment bill that has some equity provisions in it that would basically, it wouldn't be a unilateral process. NDOT would work with uh, public agencies that we're looking at either transferring roads to or, or trading roads to. Um, the uh, Transportation board bill is one that I know is, is a, a huge issue, the feeling of, of uh, or perception of equity for Southern Nevada and transportation funding is a, a driver in that bill, and that bill is still alive. So we're wa watching what happens on that. We've, we've, uh, we understand that the governor's office is the chief of staff for the governor is going to be meeting with Senator Menendo, who's the uh, sponsor of that bill, so they'll have, have some discussions on it and I'll keep you informed on how that goes. Other, other things that are happening, uh, the, we did testify for a, a bill on, on safety and, and uh, addressing a, a loophole in the open container law that uh, left, uh, it wasn't very clear that, that the driver of a vehicle of a, for a limo or a taxi cab was not allowed to have an open container, but the passengers could have. Uh, so we uh, cleaned up that bill and hopefully that'll pass so that, because one of the things that that occurs if we're not in compliance as a state on that law, the, uh, the, the feds will require NDOT to actually shift funding to the safety programs to, to look at impaired driving and, and uh, reduce our fatalities, which uh, we would rather just not be told to have to do that. We'd rather uh, make the choice ourselves on where to, to spend the funding, but I just wanted to update you on that. Um, and that pretty much concludes, oh, I wanted to mention one thing, on, on uh, Map 21, they, the U.S. Congress has to reauthorize that bill. That's the transportation authorization that kind of sets the, the level of funding and sets a lot of policy um, for the transportation program, both for, for highways and transit. It expires uh, September 30th of next year, so uh, at least we're hearing that, that they are having some discussions about um, the reauthorization. We're, we're giving input to our delegates to the to Congress, and we feel that uh, there's a, a lot of bipartisanship on the issue of transportation. So it's it's uh, hopeful that th they will address this expiration of Map 21 before it ex expires next year and, and pass a new bill that will give us longer term funding. So Map 21 provided funding for a two year period, um, but very. Uh, very good bill in, in terms of policy and, and consolidating programs, but we want to see where the, the funding will come in the future so we, we can uh, make long-term commitments on, on huge projects. Uh, that concludes my director's report. Comments or questions from the board? Commissioner June Kiliani. Thank you. 
Where are we at on AB 413 in the state's participation? I believe there's an amendment or discussion about um, having the state also participate in a, some kind of a vote. Is that correct? The, uh, I'd heard that, but I haven't confirmed what the, okay. what the language is in the bill. This um, definitely is, is uh, one that we would love to see passed for transportation funding, but we had heard that there was two provisions possibly in there in, um, for okay. ballot I, I would, yeah, if, if it does do that, in three years, in, so. and you all weigh in, it'd be great to see that we separate the Southern Nevada vote from the state so we don't impact each other. Maybe there's a, a one-year difference or something along those lines. So if you can kind of maybe have your team kind of keep an eye out. I think that would be better for everybody concerned because then you'll get state dollars. But if we do it at the same time for that public vote, it would defeat the purpose, I think, in the long run. So thanks. Thank you, me. Commissioner. I know that um, the both the, the RTC of Southern Nevada <coughs> and, and the representatives uh, in the that are watching that bill up in, in Carson City have been informing us of when the hearings are going to be held so that we can get there and testify in support of it. Other comments or questions? Uh, Rudy, I, a couple here. One is, just to clarify, the September or October deadline for invoices, these are our local member agencies that submit invoices to you, so you'll pay us. Yes. the. Uh, the ARA projects, we had agreements with uh, the local entity okay. for, for those projects that were federally funded under that economic stimulus. Uh, the projects, we assume, are, are very, they're complete or, or there's been a period of inactivity, so they're in the inactive list. So we assume it's just a matter of, of finishing the paperwork to get the final invoices in. Okay, and on the, um, the Tiger Grant, the BRT, now, you mentioned that we've identified, uh, NDOT has identified funding with a potential shortfall. What, what numbers are we talking about? The, uh, the project that NDOT had on Flamingo Road um, for a repaving project was in fiscal year 16-17 time frame, $17 million project. We were able to look at deferring two state-funded projects because you need state or local funds to really leverage the, the, that federal grant opportunity, uh, not use federal funds to leverage federal funds. So we were looking at seven and a half million dollars um, in the next fiscal year to, to be made available as state funds and then the balance of that in the, the next fiscal year. And we could enter into an agreement with RTC to commit those funds. Okay, now that the seven and a half, seven and a half, it would be uh, seven and a half and then, uh, what, nine and a half? Nine and a half, okay. In the fiscal year 15. And that would be included in uh, this year's uh, two-year budget at the state? Yes, the, uh, the state budget, our budget closed, so the, the capital program dollars were approved. Um, when they get to the, the final approval of, of all the, the state budget, it'll formally be approved, but they don't uh, identify the exact projects in, when we forward our, our budget to the legislature. So there's flexibility there. And who, uh, would this be uh, the board that makes that final decision on the commitment? My understanding, and, I, and you're well aware of it, my understanding is part of this whole application to be competitive and to move up the list is that local match. and. If we're if we're demonstrating and it's due, the application is due tomorrow. The deadline is on June third. June third. Oh, we have we have plenty of time. <laughs> but the application is it going to indicate that we have a guaranteed seven and a half and a potential nine and a half, or can we in the application commit that can I we clarify? have the entire? For the purposes of the application, we're going to show fourteen and a half million, seven million in fiscal year fourteen and seven and a half million in fiscal year 15. The balance of the two and a half million or so will be done by, will be used by ENDA subsequently uh, for ADA improvements within the corridor at a later date. Yes, right now they're 100% committed to the 14 and a half million for, the, for this Tiger Grant. But not the 17 million. The, uh, as in response to that, Commissioner, the, uh, there's a portion of work that won't be uh, 
constructed under the BRT project, okay. and it has to do with the, the long lead time to to deal with utilities for ADA improvements. So we have to assess where some ADA improvements are needed on that, and, and it requires easements from property owners when, and agreements with the utility companies to relocate. So we didn't want to get that jumbled in with, with the BRT project that could cause a delay to the BRT project. Okay, I understand. That's good. All right. Thank you, Rudy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Next item is your first citizens' participation. Thank you. This is public comment period set aside for those wishing to speak on a specific posted agenda item. And for, as a courtesy, we ask you to fill out a speaker's card. But if you don't, you're still welcome to come forward. So now is the time. Mr. Mendoza, items 28, 29, 31 and 32. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Jose Mendoza, Jr., President for the Amalgamated Transit Union Local 1637. We're still not happy with your actions uh, back in February, but I'll address that in closing comments. But I do have some questions regarding uh, the agenda item number 28. And the question is, in regards to the $2,250,000 being expended, uh, is this part of a project federally funded, and is it uh, uh, covered under 13C? Okay, and what specifically is your question? Is this a federal funded project, and is it covered under 13C? All right. That is my question. Is this a federal funded project and is it covered under 13C? Mr. Chairman, uh, staff is, purchasing staff has said that it's no. It is not a federally funded project. And legal? So it would not be covered under okay. 13C. All right. Number 29. Uh, 29, I want to go ahead and disregard. Okay. Let's disregard 29 and move on to 31. 31 also is around a $2 million project. And uh, we would like to know if this is federally funded and is it covered under 13C? Okay, same question then. Yes, it for is. For number 31. Yeah, it's federally funded by the Federal Transit Administration. Okay. And it's a design contract, so it's not covered under 13C. Okay, so yes to the first part of your question, no to the second. Thank you. And number 32? Yes, under uh, human resource item number 32, we would like to know if this is under the RTC uh, public employees or is this uh, subcontracted uh, uh, okay. employer? Understood. Yep, this, well, this would be staff, RTC staff, not, uh, not uh, uh, contracted us. Are these positions uh, covered under the SEIU contract? Correct. I yes. think that's the question. Yes, yes. 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 Okay. These, are, these are the additional positions needed for the splitting of the contract. And yes, these are SEIU RTC employees. And that would be yes. Okay. Thank you very much. And I'll make my closing comments. And the 1,100 employees are not very happy with you guys. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to speak on a posted agenda item? Now is the time. Seeing no one, we'll close this portion of public comment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. That brings us to your consent agenda items, which are made up of items 5 through 32 and may be taken in one motion. So motion on the floor on the consent. Any comments or questions? All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? That motion carries. Thank you. Item number 33 will be handled by Assistant General Manager M.J. Maynard. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, item 33 is to receive a report on the feedback received from the industry review process for project number 13-116, program administration for club ride commuter services and direct staff accordingly. The RTC released draft request for proposals and contract documents for industry review on April 11, 2013. The purpose of the industry review is an effort to issue the best possible request for proposals and to obtain industry feedback on the solicitation structure and draft contract terms and conditions. This report is a summary of feedback received through the industry review process. Uh, Lydia Belinsky, our senior contracts and purchasing analyst, will present. 
Hi, good morning, Chairman and members of the board. Um, as MJ stated, we completed the industry review process for Club Ride, or the official name of the RFP is Program Administration Transportation Demand Management Program, TDM for short. We received four responses in response to the industry review, all from TDM providers. What we had them do is answer a series of uh, a short questionnaire with eight questions, and my presentation today will kind of cover what the uh, responses were and what the overall result was. So first, the industry review process. Again, we received four responses. Uh, first question was regarding RFP organization and structure and basis of award. We did not receive any comments about this. Everyone uh, basically stated that it was very clear. The second question surrounded proposal submittal requirements. There were no real concerns identified by the firms. There were some requested uh, clarifications on some submittal items, such as the addenda, some organizational conflict of interest forms, page counts, fonts. So staff went into the RFP documents and made the clarifications that were needed to make it very clear. Asked some questions regarding the evaluation procedures and factors. Again, no real concerns identified. One firm did request that we add project measurable results uh, into the submittal requirements to be evaluated as experience, and staff has gone in and done that. One firm also requested uh, that a transition plan be evaluated as part of the work plan and budget. Staff went in and modified the documents to add that as well. Again, all the other comments on this section were regarding format. Protest procedures were also part of the survey. No questions on the protest procedures. They were very clear, easily read, and understood. We provided a budget work plan template for this RFP. Uh, we got some questions regarding how the scope of work flowed into the work plan and budget template. Staff has uh, clarified in the scope of work and updated the template so it all matches and it is consistent. We also asked for any additional comments. Most of the additional comments were specific questions about the scope of work. Staff has gone into the scope of work and made the clarifications necessary. Some of the questions that were uh, presented to us as part of the industry review really are questions that are for the Q&A process once the RFP is issued. So as far as the evaluation criteria, the weights remain the same as presented to you uh, at the April board meeting uh, with staffing plan and management organizational structure of team at 30%, work plan budget at 25%, qualifications, experiences, and references at 15%, TDM specific knowledge and experience 15%, and interviews at 15%. At our April meeting, we also presented a timeline. We did make one slight modification to the timeline, and that's the issue date of the RFP. Um, if the board approves, we'll go ahead and issue the RFP today instead of the original date of next Tuesday, May 21st. The pre-proposal conference stays the same at May 29th. Interviews will be scheduled the 9th, 10th, and 11th of July. And we'll bring back the recommended contractor and contract for award on August 8th. And services will commence on October 1st. Thank you, that's all I have. I can answer any questions if you have any. Thank you, comments or questions? I'll keep that off the public record. <laughs> so, thank you. So we are uh, asked to, oh, Commissioner G. <laughs> My senior moment's over. Um, so if we issue today, then none of us should be contacted. I just want to make sure that we know what the procedure is. With that is correct. To, okay. the, the silent period would begin today through contract award. Okay. And then through 
July? Through uh, the date that the agenda item is posted for the August board. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And we are, okay. Motion on the floor. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we'd like to, uh, with your approval, we'd like to take items 34, 35, and 36 in one motion. Uh, okay. okay. We are going to hear items 34, 35, and 36 okay. together. Okay, great. Item 34 is to receive a presentation on the tentative budget for fiscal year 2014. Item 35 is to conduct a public hearing on the tentative budget for fiscal year 2014. And item 36 is to adopt the final budget for fiscal year 2014 and direct the Department of Finance to transmit the final budget as adopted to the Nevada Department of Taxation. Our Director of Finance, uh, Mark Trosta, will now present to you. And in Thank you. opening up all three, we'll likewise open up the public hearing. Mark. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the Commission. Um, we'll start out by talking about sales tax. Our, uh, the highest revenue uh, that we receive at the RTC. As you can see, our sales tax continues to improve. Year to date, we are up 5.6% uh, and projecting the year will end at about 4.6%. We're budgeting a 3% increase for next year. If that 3% increase is realized, we will have a $26 million increase from fiscal 10, which you can see from the chart was the lowest point in our sales tax revenue. And then fuel tax is a different story. You can see that that is flat for the last several years. Our fair revenue, we're going to conservatively budget that as flat also for the fixed route and the paratransit revenue there. Our Funding sources, you can see this is a pie chart for the entire agency, um, all seven funds, and you can see sales tax is the largest piece of revenue that we do receive uh, as part of uh, the agency's entire funding. And our funding uses, uh, services and supplies, most of that is for our transit operation, and you can that's the majority there. You can see that we have uh, a lot of that is of our expenditures. And uh, in the last meeting, the debt service, 16% uh, spurred a question um, from the chairman. Um, the short answer to the debt service question in, in relation to justifying the fuel tax indexing would relate to our debt coverage as we look at how much we've borrowed so far and how much we can borrow. Currently, we have borrowed about everything we can uh, with, against the revenues that are pledged for debt. Uh, if we borrowed, we, if we tried to borrow a little more on the sales tax, that would cause us to cut our um, fixed route service area and additionally would cause some cuts in paratransit. So that would be kind of painful. Um, increasing the uh, debt on the fuel tax would be really hard because that revenue is so flat. So th that's kind of the short answer unless there's, if you want a little more explanation. Okay, thank you. Our paratransit contract cost, you can see that that continues to grow. Um, we're looking at about $41 million in fiscal 14. And that is consistent with our paratransit ridership at about 1.5 million projected for next year. Our fixed route contract cost, you see a little blip there in fiscal 13 this year, that $88 million again, that's because we have startup costs of about $3 million in, in 13. So we're pretty much level there. Our fixed route ridership, we think that'll be somewhat level uh, in 14 also. And our service hours, um, you can see that that's increased some. In fiscal 13, we've added back 24,000 hours of service, and we anticipate adding back another 46,000 hours of service in fiscal 14. This is just a, a pie chart, a simple pie chart that shows 
um, the majority of our transit expenditures are for um, services and supplies. We go to the capital budget. We're looking at uh, $33.3 million in capital in transit. That includes 150 bus shelters and 100 benches at $3.2 million. We have a transit mobility center budgeted at $6.5 million. We're looking at finishing up the UNLV transit center at $0.9 million. We have also budgeted for 70 paratransit CNG vehicles at $8 million. And we're also doing some uh, rehab work with a state of good repair grant for $2.5 million at the IBMF uh, bus yard. We're also budgeting $3.3 million, which is on the high side, for some power and communication improvements and upgrades for our ticket vending machines on the strip. That much. Um, but that is, that, that's the maximum. We, we don't, that is just the maximum. That could uh, be a, less than that. For streets and highways, we're looking at uh, projects at about $60 million for motor vehicle fuel tax and $55 million for the sales tax. Our debt situation for the sales tax bonds, you can see that we have outstanding $281 million. Our annual uh, debt payment for interest and principal um, is budgeted at $25 million. And then if we go to motor vehicle fuel tax, you can see we have $459 million outstanding there. And our annual debt service is almost $43 million. And that concludes my prepared comments uh, for the budget presentation. I'd be glad to answer any questions you might have. Comments, questions from the board? Yes, I just have one question. You know, I know the specific numbers really aren't available yet from the federal government, but have we been sort of projecting or looking forward to the, not we're looking forward to it, but the Affordable Health Care Act and the costs that are going to be associated with that and how that might affect our budgets going forward? I, I know in Henderson we're looking at it now, and it, there's some significant costs associated, but we aren't getting any specific numbers from the federal government yet. Yeah, you know, um, the articles I read, uh, a lot of our programs, hopefully, the, the employee benefits um, might not be impacted that much. Um, so if they are, we will definitely watch that and incorporate that into our plan. But like you, we don't have any specific impacts right now for that. Our, our plan is with the county, so we, we piggyback with the county for our There was a, a general fund transfer to fund uh, the funding levels that were approved in that MAP 21 uh, bill. Uh, there was a slight um, cut to that, which amounts to uh, less than 1%, I think, okay. cut to, so to us with the federal to funds. But the federal funds are always a little bit subject to what you actually get is not right. what they tell you anyway. So it's, it doesn't... It's within that, that okay. range. Anyways. Within that range. It's kind of like health care charges. You know, they charge $100 million and it really is 10000 I mean, it's just like sometimes there's no reality to it. Where is the Mobility Transit Center, the new one that was on the? The location? Yes. The Sunset Maintenance Facility. Sunset. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. This is a public hearing. Is there anyone in the audience wishing to speak on these items? Please step forward. Jose Mendoza Jr. Mr. Mendoza, don't take it personal. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. Uh, I do have a couple questions regarding uh, this budget here. Does this uh, pertain to the 2013-2014 from July 1st to June 30th of next year? That's okay, correct. I observe 7% on uh, salaries and benefits. Uh, 
Is that regards to the 207 employees that are, are RTC employees? Is that for them? Yes, that's uh, just for the transit fund. Those were transit expenditures. What's the total amount for that annual budget? Um, salaries and benefits for fund 50, it's about $11 million. For the one year? Yes. Okay. And it's for the 270 employees? No. The other, that is about 100 employees. The other uh, 178 are in our general fund. My question, Mr. Chairman, I just want to make sure I get some clarification regarding the public employees that are under SEIU. What is the annual budget cost uh, for this year that's being proposed here? That's what I really want to know. Okay. The, the total budget for salaries and supplies, I think, is about $25 million. I think, Mark, and help me if I'm wrong, Mr. Mendoza, he wants to know if you take out the employees under SEIU and the collective bargaining agreement, what is the expense in next fiscal year for salaries and benefits? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, it, it, roughly $20 million. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to speak to the board on these items? Okay. Seeing and hearing no one, we'll close the public hearing and open it up to the board for a motion. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, staff recommends approval of an adoption of the fiscal 14 budget. Motion on the floor. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? And motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the commission, our last item, our last consent, a non-consent item is to receive a presentation from Moss Adams, the newly engaged auditor for the Regional Transportation Commission of Southern Nevada. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. I'm happy to be here with you this morning. My name is Larry Carmody, a partner with Moss Adams and the lead partner for your engagement. Uh, we're pleased to be appointed as your auditors for this coming fiscal year or for this current fiscal year and I'm here today to provide a pre-audit communication to the members of the Commission that's a requirement of our professional standards I just have four items I'd like to cover with you very briefly the first is that uh, the, the scope of our audit will be performing an audit in accordance with government auditing standards a little more in-depth standard that we look at for governmental entities and we'll also be performing the audit in accordance with OMB circular A133 which is the circular of the federal government that requires um, us to do some additional work on your federal programs so we'll be doing those aspects of your audit next I'd like to talk a little bit about the timing of the audit we'll be starting the audit here in June with some planning um, as we come out and do that then do some internal control testing in July and August and the final field work in September with the goal of reporting to back to the Commission at the November Commission meeting. We met with staff yesterday and worked together to come up with uh, some milestones and a plan uh, timing of the audit so that we can um, hit those targets. Next I'd like to talk a little bit about the communication we'd like to have with the Commission. As part of our professional standards we'd like to have two-way communication with the Commission so if there are items that come to your attention as members of the Commission um, that you'd like us to consider in our audit or that you are concerned about, you're welcome to communicate those to me um, at any time. You can get uh, my contact information from the staff at the RTC. I'd be happy to talk with you about any items that uh, you believe merit extra attention or you're concerned about as it relates to the audit process or the financial aspects of the organization. We take that information, of course, and use that as we develop our audit plan. And lastly, uh, after the audit is over, in November or December, we'll be coming forward to meet with you once again, and we'll provide a number of communications on the results of the audit, in addition to the formal reports that will be released to the public in, as part of the audit document and the, the uh, comprehensive annual financial report. We'll talk with you about the qualitative aspects of accounting, our independence, um, and some of the other aspects of the financial affairs of the organization to provide you with a little bit more in-depth understanding of the results of our audit. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have or any of the other Commission members. Comments or questions? Uh, no action necessary. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Your last item is your last citizens' participation period. This is our second time set aside for public comment. Those wishing to speak to the board? Ms. Anderson. Well, I'm going to try to make it brief. I have a lot of things I have to say, but I know you have to go home sometime tonight. Um, <laughs> You have oper you have you have actually Patricia, would you put the your operators name on the are great. Would you put your name on the record? Okay. My name is Patricia Anderson and I have been going to the meetings since two thousand and one. You have great operators. We had a lot of incidents this week that I have observed. I was on the bus, just riding the bus normally. Um, the Charleston bus, as I say, you know the tracking they are they think it's their stair bus. They come with the straws on it and they drinking and every all kind of other thing. They don't have any respect for the drivers. Um, they come on, I don't have any money and this and that, and they start using profanity to drive, which is not right. Uh, well, last week on the Flamingo bus, a couple of weeks ago, I was on the bus, Flamingo bus, and a man was having a seizure. And we were right near, oh, we were at the Palms. And um, people were looking at him like, you know, looking around. I said, well, this, we're going to help this driver. We're going to help the, the man. So I worked in the hospital 26 years, so I knew what to do as far as the is concerned. So I helped him. I got him out of it. And we called the paramedics, came on the bus, and what have you. So I uh, did what I had to do uh, with that. The drivers, again, the, you, you have to realize that you have a good corporation. I mean, I know Violi is going to be leaving, what have you. I understand what you're doing. But the mistake is one, a big mistake, a very big mistake. These, these uh, drivers are out there each and every day. They're working 12 hours, 13 hours a day. What they really need, like this time point, this time point needs to stop. Their schedule is too tight. They have talked to me about it as far as Sahara, Charleston, what have you concerned. If they get to a bus stop, they should be able to stretch their legs. We're not worried about time points. We're worried about safety first. Especially on Sahara, you know, Sahara has a lot of, of the um, car dealerships, and they come out like crazy. I mean, they shouldn't have to be, I have to be the time point, we have to be at, at Spring Mountain, we have to be here, we have to be the rancho, and have you. We should be able to just give them that time period to give them chance to relax. And it should not be a point where we have to be the time point at 212, 211 here and that. That should not be, because these drivers are out there, and this is getting summertime now. Uh, I helped another one, like I said, with the bus, uh, another bus broke down and the people were cursing and carrying on, you need better buses and carrying on. I know, you I know you told me not to get involved, but I yelled at those passengers, big time. I mean, I went off. I mean, I, I just forgot where I was for a minute. Um, so, because they were saying, Do you need a better buses. I said, this driver's, I said, number one, it's gonna be okay, the driver's gonna to have to wait. We took, he took, Kurt, talked to, you know, called, he turned around again and he, cut off the AC because the fact the buses were, you know, riding the bus and everything. What we need to do, and this is what I'm trying, I've been saying this for a long time, respect this, I mean, these drivers that you have, you need to keep them right intact. I mean, not let one driver, this splitting of the yards, that's another thing which is not gonna work. Ms. Anderson, if you could. I'm sorry. Close up your comments. I'm sorry, uh, it's not gonna work. So I'm just letting you know, and I'm doing the best. I'll continue praying for these drivers, and I'll let you know exactly what's going on, okay? Thank you, and, and thank you for being the Good Samaritan. Well, I, I have a Arlen Shively. Two, quote, questions. Number one, I'm concerned, I'm a paratransit rider. I am 
very much concerned because paratransit money is federal money. I don't know how much of it comes from that little sp stuff he put up there and I don't care. I know it's a federal contract that the regional transit corporation asked for and they got a specific amount of money. I would like to know where the paratransit money goes. I don't appreciate paratransit money going over to fixed route. Now, I'm very, quote, vocal, and uh, I don't like some of seemingly, I'm on a, quote, blacklist with the RTC. They have some type of procedure down there whereby if they feel like you have done something, I haven't done anything like this lady said, people on the bus did. But there's a gentleman down there that tries to quiet me. I'm 86 years old and I'm very hard to become quieted. I lost my son uh, six months ago due to some RTC certification regulations and appeal regulations. So I'm very vocal and I presume I have a lot of hatred in my heart. But I was given a letter that I was being denied access on the paratransit for 30 days that I did not understand. 30 days, what did I do on the bus that I'm getting a 30 day suspension? So I made some telephone calls to the gentleman whose name is at the bottom of the list of the letter, who requests that you call him to discuss the matter if you don't understand it. So I got the letter on a Thursday, and I started calling, and I called on Friday. Friday at 2 o'clock, they called and told me that my ride for Saturday was canceled. I said, what? Then I turned around. I was getting ready to go for a 5 o'clock ride, and they called me back, and they said, your ride for five, for six o'clock is canceled. So I took off my clothes, and I go to bed. 10.30, here's the telephone ringing. One of my favorite friends, appeal level number three at the RTC. He says to me, your certification is being taken away from you. I will write you a letter. So in seven days, I got the letter from Mr. Level 1 and 2 saying that I was going to be arrested even if I put myself on a fixed route bus. So here I am with a sick son, no lady, no way to go, from Chicago, minimal friends out here, can't drive, so I put it in God's hands. So subsequently, my son has died. And my picture is still posted in the barn saying, do not put her on a fixed route bus. So I said, well, let me make this appeal. What have I done? I've bothered all my friends through my son's death. Everybody's taken me around the city. I haven't bothered anybody. Any, I'm talking about bothering the RTC bodies. I think I bothered one young lady, but anyway, that's another story. But anyway, I sent an appeal request. So I was told that my appeal was not going to be answered. You know, I said, what, what do you mean? I'm, I can't ride the paratransit anymore in my life. I can't ride a fixed route anymore in my life. So I said, well, let me call to somebody with the RTC beyond this paratransit grouping. I'm just concerned with paratransit. So I call the RTC, and my friend Mark at their telephone says, well, Miss Shively, we can't let your calls go up. Nobody up there wants to talk to you. I said, okay, I know nobody wants to talk to me. I'm well aware of the fact God leaves me in the world, people, 
and somebody has to talk to me. Now, I'm not the happiest person in the world. I don't put my hands on anybody. I, I'm not vicious. I'm not going to build a bomb and bring it. I'm not, but I'm very angry. I th and there are a lot of dry riders who are angry, too. We all try to respect the drivers. I have utmost respect for anybody doing a job. I have respect for you people sitting up there doing a job. When I was your age, I had a job to do. I've been retired now 24 years, and I'm out in the world, and there's a contract awarded to people like me that are handicapped, and I don't think should be denied just because there's one person at the RTC who doesn't appreciate their smiling and grinning at me. I'm not gonna grin and smile at that man. He's too young. I, I'm, not, I'm not even in his category. He shouldn't even want to speak to me. I'm so old. Ms. But Shiley, anyway, if, that's it. If you could close up your remarks. I'm through. That's enough for today. Thank if you. I live, I'll be back again with the budget and the paratransit. Thank you so much for coming down. Is there anyone else wishing to speak to the board? Step forward, place your name on the record. Hi, my name is Sam Santoria. I'm exercising my First Amendment right. Uh, back in February when you decided to split the, the fixed route system, it was to save money, and I made a suggestion maybe you should cut your budget to save money. Obviously, somebody misunderstood me. I didn't make it to the March meeting, but I couldn't help but noticing as I watched the video that the that all the SEIU members got a raise. I believe it was 3% plus cost of living, which I'm guessing is 4%. No, not that much. But just 3%? Oh, it was just you who got the cost of living? Mr. Centurio, yes. address your comments to the board. Okay, well, my comment is this. Uh, I noticed at that meeting, Mr. Keating stood up and said that our, our general manager here was an underpaid. She was 16th on a list of 18 people in the same size properties. I mean, personally, I thought she was making enough money uh, because she makes more than the Vice President of the United States, more than the head of the CIA, and more than the Secretary of State. But this is Las Vegas. I guess things are different here. So he suggested a raise on her behalf. And I, usually you people go behind closed doors to discuss things, but I couldn't help but notice Chris G. jumped right up, says 3% cost of living too. And you all agreed on it. No discussion or anything. This, this seems like to be is on more on the up and up than, uh, pro wrestling is more on the up and up than what goes on here. This is a very fixed game you people run. And, and that's just the way I feel, I'm sorry. Uh, but I do have one little joke, I don't know if I've told it before, and it's, what's the difference between a fishing boat and the way the RTC awards bus contracts? And the answer to that one is one smells very fishy and the other one's a boat. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to speak to the board this morning? Please step forward and place your name on the record. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Maya Santos. My question to you is why are you splitting up the bus contract? If, if you could pull that mic down. My question to you is why are you splitting up the bus contract? This is public comment. We, we're not allowed to discuss your questions. We can certainly have staff talk to you after the comment period. Do you know that my dad and most of his coworkers may, may be out of a job? I see that my, I've seen my dad interact with most of the passengers on his bus. I also see him bring home thank you letters and cards from the locals and out of towners. My dad enjoys and loves his job and neither him or nor his coworkers deserve this unacceptable treatment. I feel that my father and his coworkers should be working for the RTC so that we're not back here again in two to three years because you're not happy with the contractors and you have clause in the contract that say if you're not happy you can, with their performance that you can terminate it. Thank you, and, and I'm sorry, did you put your name on the record? Okay, yeah. thank you. Good morning, my name is Edson Santos. I'm with ATU 1637. I am a current employee of Veolia. Come July 7th, uh, 2013, what's gonna happen to me and my coworkers? Who will pay us when Veolia is out after midnight? Did you look at this from all angles? 
or did you rush into it like you, like all the other mistakes you have made in the past? One you cannot fix in, cannot fix in four days like you did to deuce the 108. There are going to be repercussions from this. You will all have to answer for and not point fingers at each other. We are not a piece of meat that you can dangle. We are people with rights, but in this town, we don't have any. You said on February 14th that if you don't like either company, you can terminate their contract. When you can terminate their contract, where is my longevity? Because we will be right back here again. So what does that teach my kids? It's okay, daddy might have a job next time this happens or not. It's like playing Russian roulette. One of my coworkers and dear friends passed away because he was stressed out about the split and so am I. If you want to fix the problem, ask somebody who knows how. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Commissioners, I would like to close uh, on behalf of the bargaining unit that uh, the staff of RTC and the commissioners, uh, 11, almost 1,100 employees have received a layoff notice. We are very disappointed to your actions. Uh, we are right now negotiating with uh, Keolis and MV. Uh, Keolis seems to be receptive to an, in, uh, an agreement that we are asking for both companies to sign. Uh, apparently, MV, we're having a little bit of problems. Uh, we cannot move forward and uh, with one company is being very receptive and the other one is not. We hope that Envy starts to wake up a little bit and really start negotiating with our international uh, reps. Uh, we are very disappointed. 1,100 employees lay off and, and I believe some are going to be displaced. And when they get displaced, you'll be hearing from our international office. I am very sad to say that 1,100 employees you guys displaced. Well, 200 and some employees represented by SEIU, they're well paid. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else wishing to speak to the board? Please step forward and place your name on the record. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Barbara Powell. I'm the elected vice president of local ATU Local 1637. Um, 17-year employee of the transit system, and I would like to let you know that it's not working. It's not working. As our quasi-employer, and I know that you don't like to be called that, but it is true, because you are able to dismiss um, an operator or anyone in the transit system if they do something that you figure is too, you know, too far over the line. Um, with that being said, I think that it's time maybe for you guys, ladies, gentlemen, to kind of step in and um, oversee what's going on. Um, we are less than 60 days out uh, for the transition to be made. It's not going smoothly. Um, we don't, we have employees that don't know who they're going to be employed by. Um, we're told that our salaries are going to basically remain the same. It makes no sense if we have people that are at one yard who actually went there to follow their routes. Now their routes are coming back to their original yards. They're wanting to um, apply there. And because of the chaos, they're not being able to do that. And these are people that are senior to me. I have 17 years. And they're not being able to apply for their jobs. What, what happens with our seniority? What, 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 you know, where did that go? Um, in the beginning, you were told, we were told that all of that would be honored. Apparently, it's not. Um, and I think that it would, it, it would definitely do good if you would kind of, I know that you say that you can't um, bargain with us directly, 
but you need to step in and make sure that things are going going well. We still have nothing signed, nothing. Um, and I guess with that being said, I'd like to say thank you, and I hope that you know that you will follow suit and kind of see what's going on here. Um, we don't want to use that S word. We don't want to not do what it is that you know that that we're hired to do. But we're not hired by anybody as it stands right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Powell. Good morning, I'm Carolyn Higgins. Um, I'm up here just to piggyback all of the, um, Barbara Powell, our, our workers out here. We're hearing from them constantly. What do we do? How do we do this? This was posted, that was posted. It's at a disarray right now. That impacts safety of our buses. A lot of our drivers are very worried because of the unknown, and that's a human reaction to everything. Um, their children, this young lady got up and spoke about her dad. My grandkids are saying, so grandma, what you doing? I'm, 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 I'm trying hard to soothe people who are very concerned. We are all concerned about what is going to happen to our future, okay? So, um, at one point in time, I hope everyone is aware that we are human too. Safety is number one with us as well and our customers and getting them from point A to point B. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak to the board this morning? Seeing and hearing no one, we'll close the public comment period. And Commissioner June Kiliani. Thank you. I, I think it would be helpful for the board to get an update on what is happening with the transition. We don't want to leave people in limbo. I know there was supposed to be a sign-in sheet for the yard, so maybe that would be very helpful. And then we should be monitoring how that's going. So I'm assuming that we have a team together. So. Um, a report back to the board if sure. that's acceptable. We'll Mr. do Chair. a formal report to you at the next board meeting, but why don't I, I think on a weekly basis, um, staff and I will report to you on how the transition is going. We do have a team that is involved very closely, meeting weekly with both um, Bail uh, Keolis and MV, so okay. we'll report with you. And that uh, comment was also shared by Councilwoman March as far as updating the board. Okay. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>